welcome to welcome to the last session to the last keynote lecture and uh, as the president of the EPNS the Pediatric Neurology Society of Europe I'm happy to chair this session in combination with your conference and I'm very honored to present the next talk because I learned that uh, Mara Dearson and her colleagues here placed in Barcelona did a lot of instrumental work which actually combines both of our fields. Mara has been uh, studying pharmacology and did her PhD, I think, in that field, and then she started to elaborate on cognition and developmental um, diseases such as fragile X and Down syndrome, and she establishes uh, a link and also therapeutic avenues in order to address these issues. She works with a team of many people, biophysicists and um, other people instrumental in computer design and uh, analysis of all the new data that are obtained. And I'm happy to listen to her talk and would like to forward you to the stage to present the talk, New Plasticity as a Therapeutic Target of Intellectual Disability. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me today here. It's a great pleasure being uh, at the ECAD, EACD, sorry. <laughs> and um, it's a great pleasure because I think uh, that uh, we should uh, stop thinking of neuroscience and uh, uh, other more clinical or more applied disciplines as something separate. We have to start thinking on them as something that can be applicable. So the, our findings, hopefully, will be applicable to clinics. And um, today I will show you some of our results uh, about uh, how we brought from the very basic science our results into clinical trials. And basically, I will target a concept that is neural plasticity. But let's first start with some facts and figures. As you know, intellectual disability defines developmental disorders characterized by limitations both in intellectual capacity but also adaptive behavior. It originates as uh, many of the other neurodevelopmental diseases in, in childhood, and it, uh, it really places a, a disproportionate burden, both from the social care, the medical care, but also at the educational level. And there is no treatment for it. By now, we don't have a treatment. Interestingly, when you look at the rest of the neurodevelopmental disorders, autism spectrum disorders, global developmental delay, attention and hyperactivity disorders, social communication disorders, all of them share symptoms that are similar. Meaning that all of them share a, a myriad of, of different alterations in the brain that are overlapping. And in fact, we can trace back these alterations at the behavioral level right back into not just the neuronal structure and the microcircuits, but also into the molecular and genetic level. So let's start by gathering an idea of the complexity of the problem we are tackling. And let me uh, mention or quote Santiago Ramón y Cajal that, as you know, was a Spanish neuroscientist, probably the most fundamental neuroscientist in, in our history, and he said that the, world, the brain is a world consisting of a number of unexplored continents and great stretches of unknown territory. And these, that was said more than 100 years ago, still stands. We know a lot, but we still don't know how the brain works. So let's put it in numbers. 86 billion neurons, as you know, some years ago, it was said 100 billion, but in fact, when they counted again, it was 86 billion. Of course, uh, this is uh, the, in the typical human that, as you may know, is a male, 70 kilos, 55 years. So they don't count the neurons of female, I don't know. Maybe we have too many, I don't know. Anyhow, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. 
But the interesting thing is that the most important feature of these neurons is how they connect to each other. So in the brain, it's like in life. You know, the most important is your connections. Who do you meet? When do you meet him? How do you meet him? If you bump into somebody, what do you say? So in terms of biology, this is the same with neurons. The most important is how they connect. And they connect through structures that, as you know, are called synapses. And these synapses, these synapses contain millions of molecules a myriad of molecules, of different molecules with different functions that can then boost this neural transmission. So they are kind of physical chemical microprocessors, let's say so, right? And uh, as you know, most neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric, and even neurological disorders are considered synaptopathies, right? So, but in fact, this brings to an idea, and the idea is that, you know, behavior, cognition, those are not properties at a single neuron level. No, those are emergent properties of a circuit. What means emergent properties? It means that you cannot explain them just by looking at single people. So if you have been ever to the Barça Stadium, for example, and you have seen these waves of people going up and down, Right? So this is an emergent behavior. You cannot explain it by the behavior of one of the uh, supporters of Barca, right? You have to look at all of them. So here is the same. And how does it work? What is important there? So important features are the topological characteristics of the neural architecture. Because in this neuron, we have these branches that are called dendrites that are like antennas from the neuron. So those structures receive information, and this information, depending on how this is constructed in space, will be from one region or from a different region, right? So if we put it in a different location, we will get the information from different parts of the brain. Not only that, but also the neuronal physiology, how these neurons are processing the information and giving rise to bioelectrical signals, which are a fundamental language in our brain, right? So all of these will define how the information is processed at the circuit level, which is what finally gives rise to these behavioral changes or alterations, okay? The interesting thing is that you don't have a static solid brain. Part of it is solid. Part of it has to be stable in time. But a lot of it is moldable by the environment, right? And this property is called plasticity. So all this connectivity can be fine-tuned using this property that is called plasticity. And in fact, the brain is constantly remodeling. And here you see examples of new connections being made, some connections being lost. And this is the basis of fundamental functions like learning and memory. But it's not only that. We can make also new neurons in some very specific parts of the brain, even though this is a bit questioned in humans now. And for sure, we can change the genetics of the cells, the epigenetics, right? So if we should define the plastic brain, neuroplasticity would be understood as the ability of the nervous system to change its activity or even its structure, reorganizing also the function, the connections, right, in response to both intrinsic and extrinsic stimuli. This is what helps us to adapt to the environment, to a changing environment, right? And this is some of the problems that uh, appear when uh, you don't have correct plasticity. You cannot adapt, okay? So plasticity is fundamental to adapt, to learn, to recover from lesions, and it's also fundamental in uh, brain development. So this is a lifelong property of the brain, and as I said, it can have different forms, right? How the neurons are proliferating, especially during development, 
how they are creating these uh, contacts. These dendritic spines are the postsynaptic part of a synapse, right? So, and this makes it very beautiful because the, these arbors look like uh, roses, no, uh, rose trees. And um, this uh, plasticity can also be defined as new synapses or pruning of synapses, so reorganizing the connectivity of a neuron. And it can also uh, come in a, for, in a more functional form of came changing the strength of the contact. You may have a contact, no, I don't know, uh, I always put this example to my students, how many contacts do you have, I don't know, in the social media, no? Uh, now it's not anymore Facebook, I think it's Twitter or something, or Instagram. <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you can be in contact with somebody, he can be following you, but you don't have any message for years, and suddenly you have many messages for this person. No, you, you reinforce this contact because you are interested in it, for example. And then we will not touch this today, we will just touch it indirectly, but also the genomic plasticity. So it's, our genes are our genes. This is our, uh, let's say, genetic uh, makeup, but these can be modulated by the environment. So the epigenetic aspects are very important nowadays. And if you, you want, if you are curious, we can also discuss new therapies based on epigenetics. So, as I say, plasticity is a lifelong property that allows during development to create these circuits in the brain. In the adult, of course, these processes are a little bit different and they are not intended to build up a circuit, but to reorganize the circuit locally so that we can store the information. So the, 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 let's say, physical trace of a memory stands in this reinforcement and uh, debilitation of specific synapses, right? And of course, in the older part of, of our lives, um, this uh, brain plasticity helps to uh, delay the cognitive decline or the appearance of neurodegenerative disorders. So in the development, in fact, what we know is that um, the, the neurons are generated, are proliferating at really staggering rates, right? So more than 3.8 billion each hour during the prenatal cortical neurogenesis and approximately 4.6 million each hour in the whole CNS. And not only that, they have to also reorganize in space. For example, here we see the closure of the neural tube. So, we are studying all these processes, not just from the, let's say, um, molecular or cellular point of view, but also the mechanical point of view. And what we see is that there are many forces involved in that. So basically, um, the, this neurogenesis and the synapses that are also formed at very high rates are the main aspects in the neural development. But in fact, this, this is not just during the prenatal time, right? So in fact, humans have a extremely prolonged developmental course. And this allows both genetics, but also environmental factors to really shape the brain together, right? And this shapes also, of course, the function of the brain, cognition, emotion, social capabilities, etc. So basically, this is what I, you see here. After birth, we still have changes at the neuronal level in the size of the neurons, in that give rise also to the brain weight, increase in brain weight, and also a remodeling of the synaptic content, right? So synapses increase and then have to be pruned, right? And here you see the same image as before. So the final wiring of the brain occurs after birth and is governed not just by the influence of these genetic factors, but mainly by the environmental experience. However, this prolonged brain development tells us again that we have to forget about these initial critical periods as the only, let's say, window for intervention, right? So it's much more longer. And in fact, let me propose something, <laughs> because in fact, uh, what I think is that having neurodevelopmental disorders is in part a consequence of brain evolution, of human brain evolution. Why? Because it is the emergence of neuroplasticity processes that have enabled the brain complexity. But of course, 
this requires a trade-off, right? Between this uh, increase in the complexity and the possibility of developing these neurodevelopmental disorders, right? And as an example, some newly developed genes and variants of genes are really involved in the, in the size and complexity of the human brain compared to other non-hominid species, right? So, in fact, all these processes that I mentioned before have been shown to be altered in many neurodevelopmental disorders, right? And if you look at the genes, in fact, there are many genes involved in plasticity that are shared across neurodevelopmental disorders, right? And there are disorders that affect synaptic scaffolding, others affect synaptic signaling or transcriptional deregulation. But all of them tackle the synapse. And what this gives rise to is to an altered microarchitecture. And you can see that across disorders, we have alterations in the number of dendrites here, for example, compared to the wild type, to the normal person. And as you see also in the shape and the number of the dendritic spines that you can use as a proxy of the synaptic complement, okay? So, in fact, this is important because if you remember what I explained before about this emergent brain function, imagine that you have smaller neurons, right? Then your target area is smaller also. The area of influence that you can cover will be smaller, right? And if you have less spines, you will have a reduced connectivity scheme. And this, of course, has a consequence in function, okay? So you can imagine that if we have our mind here, our brain here, the brain perception, for example, or whatever other function depends on how these neurons are connected, how they function, and how they form these microcircuits. So, of course, if this is altered, then you will have things like, for example, here I put you one example of uh, William Byrne syndrome versus Down syndrome individuals. And uh, in this local versus, focal, local versus uh, global task, you can see that the performance is completely opposite, right? And interestingly enough, these disorders also affect different brain regions. So there is a clear, um, let's say, relationship between both. So having all these common processes tells you, and let me put this already on the table, that what we find for intellectual disability is probably also applicable to other intellectual disability and neurodevelopmental disorders, okay? So basically, targeting synaptic and neural function, neural circuit dysfunction, uh, this may provide a, an interesting and tractable approach for new therapies in developmental disorders. But let me just go into our story. And uh, I hope you will enjoy it because I think it's very exciting. So I will explain you how we tackle the problem of trying to see how we could manipulate neuroplasticity as a therapeutic target in Down syndrome. And Down syndrome is one of the most complex genetic disorders uh, that you can imagine that are leading to, to intellectual disability. This is uh, driven, Down syndrome is driven by the trisomy of chromosome 21, meaning that it creates a global gene dosage disequilibrium. And this not only affects chromosome 21, it spreads across the whole genome, right? Through transcription factors or other regulators, right? So this chromosome 21 trisomy leads to important neuroanatomy alterations in Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is characterized by a reduced brain volume and a gross brain weight reduction also, a lower number and depth of cerebral sulci, enlarged vesicles, ventricles, and uh, hypoplasia of several regions. So it's not distributed equally across the brain. So you have, for example, the cerebellum or the hippocampus are mainly affected and also the prefrontal cerebral cortex. So 
if we zoom in and look at the neural microarchitecture in Down syndrome, what we see is that, in fact, there is a reduction in the complexity of the dendritic trees compared to euploid people, but there is also a reduced spine component. So we have less connectivity in the Down syndrome brain, right? And this starts in, during development, so we have alterations in the size, in the shape, the complexity, the connectivity, but it's maintained and even pronounced uh, during adulthood, uh, thus suggesting a dendritic simplification. So what we did was we used mouse model to try to answer the question of how plasticity was contributing to the Down syndrome phenotype. And um, the good thing about uh, mouse models is that they share many physiological and genetic aspects with humans. And in fact, we can either use a trisomy model, so we have a trisomic mouse model uh, kind of recapitulating the whole Down syndrome disorder, but this of course doesn't tell us, for example, which genes of this chromosome 21 might be involved in specific phenotypes. So for that, what we can do is we can overexpress selectively one gene in an otherwise euploid background. So this means that we will understand what is the impact of having three copies, not of the whole chromosome as in the trisomic mouse, but only of one gene. And we will see whether we can recapitulate only with the overexpression of that gene the whole phenotype. Okay? So why this is interesting for cognition? Because you know, um, it is quite important to go from, let's say, quite simple systems, right? Uh, because those, <laughs> if you study simple systems from the cognition point of view, then you can understand much more complex systems. No? <laughs> and you know, he's still there. Okay, so the first question, of course, was can we recapitulate the phenotypes in our trisomic mouse models? And the answer is yes. When we look at the neurons and look at these beautiful histological uh, images uh, that I did in collaboration with Javier de Felipe in Madrid, uh, and you do this by looking through the microscope and drawing like this, I mean, <laughs> since then I use glasses, yes. Anyhow, as you see, the trisomic neurons are smaller and also less complex, right? And they have less spines. So we, said, we thought, okay, let's see if this affects cognition. And for studying cognition, we studied something that is called the visual spatial learning and memory. This means that you have to orient yourself and create these cognitive maps to find a place, right? So. If you, for example, enter through this door, you know that I will be on your right. But if you enter through that door, I will be on your left. And this rotation is done mentally, right? And it's not true that female read maps worse than males. Okay, so it's this function allows uh, an animal, that is, we put them in a water maze, and they don't like water, so they tend to escape. So there is a platform hidden in the water, under the water, and the first day they have no idea where the platform is, but suddenly they find it. So you put them on the platform, they look around, and they see all these cues around, so like these doors, right? And then along the sessions they learn and they can find very fast the platform. So let me show you just one example. This is a wild-type mouse, so an euploid mouse, and there is the platform, as you see, the white dot, and the mouse is going there, pumps. Very clever. So, measuring the time it takes to arrive to the platform, you can create this nice learning curve. So, uh, in the fourth session or around the fourth session, the mice, the wild type mice, already know where the platform is and they go there directly, right? Instead, what happens with the trisomics is that they cannot learn. So this is the same session as I showed you for the wild type. And as you see, they are using these not very efficient strategies of going around, like, you know, when, like when you park in a parking and you don't remember where the car was and then you go through the whole parking back and forth, right? 
So they do the same. And even they try to use strategies like, uh, you know, trying to escape through this wall that is impossible. So this makes that their learning curve is much worse, right? Good. So then we thought, okay, could we uh, associate these deficits to plasticity, to reduce plasticity? And um, to this aim, we took our mice to school, so meaning that we put them in big, cages with big social groups, a lot of tasks to do, also uh, problems to get their food and so on, so that they have to really um, make up their, their brains. No? And this is compared to the normal impoverished, uh, let's say, situation. And uh, what we wanted to see is whether this experience-dependent plasticity is dri driving this increase in the number of spines, in the number of contacts, etc. right? So, and in fact, just changing a little bit the task to make it even more challenging and boost your plasticity. Uh, now what we look at is the recognition memory. So this means that uh, if we put two similar objects and then we change one of the objects by a new one, if the mouse knows that it's a different one, it will discriminate. It will explore more the new one, right? So what happens is that the wild-type mice can discriminate very nicely, but the trisomic mice, these in black, they cannot discriminate. They explore the same if it's a new, if it's not a new, they don't care, right? And um, then when we enrich the animals, what we see is that, especially in the trisomics, we can completely recover this recognition memory deficit. So great, it looks that it works. However, when we look at longer term, so we do the intervention and then we test them immediately after, but then we wait four months and we look at them again. And what happens is that in fact, while the wild types stay more or less in the same performance, the trisomics go back to the initial state. So it means that it's not driving a long-term change. We cannot do one intervention and Hey, I forget about it. No. Okay, so when, when we look at the synaptic contacts, meaning the number of dendritic spines or the number of uh, the proxy number of uh, these synaptic contacts, is significantly increased in wild type, but it's not increased at all in the trisomic. So, meaning that this suggests that this lack of structural, stable structural plasticity is what is explaining that we lose this effect. So, okay, we thought, okay, could it be that some of the genes in chromosome 21, when it's overexpressed, when we have three copies, might be responsible for this lack of stable plasticity? So, this is challenging because, of course, you have more than 350 genes there, right? And you need to find this molecular sculptor that allows you to remodel the neuron. And of course, we, was, we searched initially the usual suspects genes, right? So APP, base 2 TSCR1, so genes that are normally associated with learning and memory deficits, etc. But in the end, we found a gene that is called diagonate. It's a kinase. What means that it's a kinase? It's like a molecular interrupter. Kinases, what they do is open or close molecular cascades, right? And what is interesting about Diagone is that it opens or closes many cascades that are involved in synaptic plasticity, are involved in neurodegeneration, etc. So this means that it's like a hub, right? Like an influencer, let's say so. So it's like an interrupter that could open or close the whole room, not just one little light there or here. And the other thing that is interested, interesting is that it's very conserved. And now we know that having too much or too least dose of Diagone A leads to intellectual disability because there is a disease that is called Diagone A, exactly like the gene. And those patients uh, show microcephaly, intellectual disability, language problems, epilepsy, etc. Okay? So, the first thing was okay. If I only overexpress Tiaguane, do I recapitulate the phenotype? 
Can I recapitulate the whole phenotype that I see in the trisomic just overexpressing the A, just with three copies of the A? And the, the answer is yes, we can. So the A is sufficient to reduce the size and complexity of the neurons and produce learning and memory deficits, meaning that it's probably very important for this function, right? So the second question was, okay, if DIA1A produces memory alterations. And then these alters also the circuits and their connectivity, right? So then, could we target this gene and improve and reorganize the circuits? So, first thing that we did was, okay, let's normalize the dosage of the gene itself. And to this aim, we use gene therapy, right? We injected this therapy in the brains of our mice, and what we found is that, again, here you have the discrimination uh, task, here you see the deficit in the trisomic that is completely recovered by normalizing DIAC1A. And let me just emphasize that we are simply normalizing DIAC1A. And not only that, but this leads also to a recovery of one of the processes that is driving the synaptic strength, right? And it's called long-term potentiation. So the deficits in the transgenic mice were recovered, in the trisomic mice were recovered. And this indicates that new connections are formed. Of course, unfortunately, by now, we cannot use gene therapy in people. So we had to find something that was druggable, right? And given that DIA1A is a kinase, meaning an enzyme, we thought, okay, let's try a DIA1A kinase inhibitor, right? Let's normalize it using a drug that it, normalizes its activity, this interruptor activity, right? So what uh, was found by another group was that, in fact, a green tea polyphenol called a catechin called epigallocatechin gallate that can cross the blood-brain barrier, good news. This was a quite specific and strong potent inhibitor of diagonae. Good. Good news, right? So we tried to use epigallocatechin gallate to see whether we could improve memory and maybe reorganize to some extent the circuits in our mice. So, in fact, when we provide um, the epigallocatechin gallate, what we see is that, in fact, the kinase activity of DIA1A is reduced to normal. This is good news, because if you use a very potent inhibitor, maybe you are boosting or reducing too far the kinase activity, right? So the first thing that we need to know is, hey, are we surpassing too much these levels, or are we in the correct level? And in fact, you see that the increase in kinase activity with respect to the wild type is normalized by the treatment. So by then, we were okay. <laughs> then if we look at what happens with uh, the object recognition again, what you see is that the deficit was completely rescued by the treatment again. Not only that, but look at this picture. So this is a study done in, in this case, transgenic mice that uh, are expressing a green fluorescent protein in the pyramidal neurons in the hippocampus. That was one of the structures that, as you remember, was most affected in Down syndrome and is also responsible for the spatial learning and the object recognition memory, right? So in the transgenics, this is completely disorganized, as you see. But then when we treat the animals with epigallocatechin gallate, look at that. So now I am waiting for the wow. <laughs> because this is what we thought, right? And for us, it was like <laughs> these moments no, that you cannot believe. OK, so all these very interesting um, data, um, well, were very encouraging so that we decided to go for a first clinical trial, right? And um, in the first clinical trial, we simply was a kind of a safety uh, uh, study, right? We wanted to see whether it could have 
some deleterious effects. It didn't. But we start showing a little increase in cognitive function. It was not very important. This was done in adults. But it was there. So the next thing was to go to a phase two clinical trial. And here, what we did was we studied not only the effect of epigallocatechin gallate. We wanted to see whether we could boost the effects of cognitive training with the drug, right? And we had two groups, so one was placebo plus cognitive stimulation, EGCG plus cognitive t stimulation during one year, and now we know that less than one year is useless, so at least you have to do it for one year, and then we had six months follow-up uh, to see whether the effects were stable in time. And um, in fact, we included also a first phase in which all the patients, both the, those in the group of placebo and in the group of EGCG, were treated with placebo, so that we could kind of discard this initial placebo effect in which if you, somebody tells you, oh, this is fantastic, it will work with you, it works, right? And we have examples of this all across, even in Parkinson's and et cetera, right? So the pills were normal. They were not uh, very interesting or so. That has also been correlated with efficacy. So and here are the results. And this is a composite of the different uh, adaptive behavior and uh, cognitive tests. And as you see, compared to this is baseline here, and compared to the uh, placebo group, that didn't change too much, I have to say, and we can discuss why cognitive stimulation did not work so well. <laughs> but uh, look at the EGCG-treated group. So all these differences were, of course, significant. But what was even more interesting, so we decided to also do neuro functional neuroimaging because um, we wanted to have like a more biological readout of what was going on. So here you see in different regions the activity before treatment when they do this specific task. And you see that, okay, mainly the kind of more occipital area, the visual area is uh, highlighted. And here you see the comparison post-treatment. And you see that many other more cognitive-related regions are engaged and also the levels of activity are higher. And finally, we also try to search for a possible biomarker, and we use homocysteine plasma concentrations that were slightly increased, of course not at pathological levels, compared to the control group. And this is a biomarker of the organ A activity. So it was like a kind of proxy uh, for, for the target of our treatment. So as a conclusion, um, I would propose that um, these diagonal A inhibitors boost environmental plasticity, dependent plasticity, allow network rewiring both in mice and in humans. And uh, in fact, what we think is that they bring back to normal the uh, Down syndrome neurons. So just to come back to what I said. Good. <laughs> um, remember that we were saying that all these disorders share some common mechanisms. So these uh, boosted two new studies. One was in, in pediatric patients, and we just finished it, and we can discuss. I will not show the results, but they were positive. We are about to publish it. But the other was a, a clinical trial in fragile X syndrome patients. And interestingly enough, it also worked there in a different scale, let's say. So it was uh, working, uh, we, we did some electrophysiology studies there, uh, but it was also improving cognition and social abilities in these in this patients. So um, the idea is that, of course, even if you have little improvements, these can change the life of people from a dependent life to a more or less independent life, right? But uh, please don't forget that we can, of course, target plasticity, like in Down syndrome, by using these uh, drugs. But it's not only that. We need multi-component interventions, right? So 
what we are doing now is going into different interventions, not only cognitive training and neuropharmacology, we have included exercise, social activities, nutrition, and also, for example, non-invasive brain stimulation. So in our opinion, in my opinion also, um, this is what can really make the difference, right? And for example, as an example here, this has also biological roots. When people make ex do exercise, they are increasing BDNF production, so a neurotrophic factor, right? And in mice, this drives an increased neurogenesis, for example. So even though you think, well, there are non-pharmacological interventions, what could be? No, it's the opposite. They do have an impact on the brain. What you guys do has an impact on the brain. That's it. So to finalize, I hope I have convinced you that neuroplasticity is a great target for intellectual disability and probably other neurodevelopmental disorders. And let me finish again with a sentence of Cajal that says, any man could, if he were so inclined, be the sculptor of his own brain. Thank you. Mara, thank you very much for this really fantastic talk, which covers a lot of basic um, things, and I look forward to treating my patients and their futures <laughs> with intellectual disability, which is in our pediatric neurology uh, group uh, the common problem next to epilepsy um, and, and inflammatory diseases. But it's, it's a only last week I, I saw at least 10 kids on the station coming for intellectual disability and I think there is probably hope and scope in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>